I stumbled upon the crime scene in a small town called Pineswood, located deep within the woods of Oregon. It was a particularly unnerving sight, but before I could process what my eyes had fallen upon, a local named Jebediah Clarkson hollered at me from afar. Hey there, what brings you to Pineswood? You here to help us? He asked. I'm Frank Hutchinson, a writer, I said, visiting here on vacation. We exchanged stories, and I learned about his life as the town's eccentric handyman. As our conversations progressed, I found myself invited to join Jebediah and his cohorts as they investigated an unsettling murder. Bound by a morbid curiosity, I agreed. On our way to the tormented area, cop lights filled the street with a tense atmosphere. Lisa Bransford, an aspiring detective, described how everything we knew about standard crime scenes would be challenged tonight. The victims were left mutilated in ways most of us had never seen before. I didn't suspect anything otherworldly, yet. Perched on the edge of Pineswood Forest stood a row of shabby cabins where the horrifying scene awaited us. The group expectedly fell silent as we entered. Pushed up against the nearest wall and missing parts of their flesh, the corpses were grotesquely scarred. Despite my initial shock, we began scouring for clues and any sign of the villain. However, every lead only led to more questions without answers. Then we found tracks leading into the forest, footprints that appeared reptilian in nature. Soon we were pushing through a claustrophobic clearing within the dense forest. Alex Thompson, an avid outdoorsman among us, pointed out strange flora he had never encountered before. Sprawling vines thorny enough to shred through tough fabrics were wound around innocent trees like serpentine ropes. It seemed as if nature itself had been manipulated by the hands of an unknown menace, and whatever that force was, we could feel it looming closer with each step we took. The deeper we went, the darker the forest became. Branches, ominously interlocked overhead, blurring the line between nature and something more sinister. As our search continued, we stumbled upon a decrepit cabin nestled at the heart of Pineswood Forest. It was all too eerie to be a coincidence. As we approached with trepidation, the odor of rot and decay filled our nostrils. Inside, the walls were splayed with claw marks and gore, a ghastly reminder of events that took place. Cautiously, we navigated the darkened room when suddenly there was movement. A blood-curdling screech echoed throughout the space, making our hearts race faster than ever before. The terrifying abomination before us was monstrous in size. Each movement conducted by its reptilian limbs left grotesque cracks on the ground. Lashing out its clawed talons, it effortlessly flung Jebediah across the cabin. Choked gasps escaped our mouths as his lifeless body hit the wall hard enough to have shattered every bone in his body. There wasn't time to dwell on his death. Alex scrambled to his feet while Lisa grabbed whatever weapons she could find, an axe and a revolver. With gravely fierce determination to survive etched on each face, we prepared for a gruesome fight against this living nightmare that conspired in our midst. We mustered all courage possible, as these gruesome terrorists might be of this earth or beyond, but wanted nothing more than to claim their malicious victory over innocent lives. With the monstrous creature before us, there was no time to think or strategize. It was clear we needed to do something before all of our lives were gruesomely ended. We need to get out of here, shouted Alex. Lisa and I nodded in agreement, but fear paralyzed our legs. Despite the urgency, we couldn't find the willpower to escape. It was then that we heard a faint voice from behind us. Guys! Jebediah wheezed with strained breaths, miraculously alive. Go! Please! His survival rekindled the fire of hope within us, and we managed to take action. Weaving through the wreckage of the cabin, we barely managed to avoid being eviscerated by the creature's massive claws. It let out another blood-curdling screech, sending chills down our spines as it pursued us relentlessly. We stumbled our way back outside and sprinted through Pineswood Forest, 
disoriented but fueled by adrenaline. The monster's unnerving roars echoed through the forest as we made our desperate escape, its unmistakable footfalls indicating it was hot on our trail. Knowing how futile it would be to call for help in these remote woods, we directed all our energy toward running faster than ever before. Still gripping the axe and revolver tightly in her hands, Lisa attempted to use them against this seemingly invincible antagonist. But every bullet and swing were fruitless, as they only seemed to further infuriate this menacing beast. By some stroke of luck or divine intervention, we stumbled upon a cave hidden deep within Pineswood Forest that seemed like the perfect place to hide from this murderous monstrosity. Without hesitation, we darted inside and scrambled to find a narrow passage where the creature would be unable to follow. The seemingly endless twists and turns within the cave provided just enough cover for us as we ducked behind a heap of rocks. We allowed ourselves a moment to catch our dwindling breaths as we listened intently, praying that the creature had given up its pursuit. For a precarious moment, we held on to hope. Reflecting on the appearance of our assailant with newfound dread, my mind desperately tried to make sense of its twisted form. Its scales and snake-like head were an unnerving mix of alien and reptilian features, a menacing abomination that brought into question everything I knew to be true about reality. As soon as the distant snarls began to fade, we knew we couldn't afford to wait any longer. We tiptoed our way out of the cave, doing our best not to make a sound while listening for any signs that the beast might still be nearby. With each step toward freedom, the weight of our ordeal began to sink in. The unknown species that had nearly claimed our lives made these woods feel as though they belonged to another world. One cruel, unforeseeable twist in fate had nearly sealed our doom in such a devastating manner. Finally, we emerged from Pineswood Forest, tired and traumatized but alive. Our relief was palpable as we vowed never to return to those cursed woods again. For who knew what other horrors lurked within? In the days that followed, Jebediah eventually succumbed to his brutal injuries as Lisa and I mourned his passing. The three of us should have been just more victims to this mysterious fiend of nature. Yet instead, we are left here with memories filled with nightmare-fueled dread and an unending curiosity about the terrifying creature still prowling Pineswood Forest, just waiting for its next prey. And as for me... I ponder my own future, knowing full well that it will always cast a dark shadow over my life. We'd barely escaped Pineswood with only a harrowing tale of bloodshed and terror to remind us of how close death had visited. Every night since then, I have wondered if our tormentor had been appeased, or if it remains hidden in the shadows, waiting for the day when the scent of fear brought it forth once again. A thought that haunts my very existence leaving me a mere shell of the person I once was. I woke up with a pounding headache and a groan. Last night's party lingered in my mind as I dragged myself out of bed. To Jasper for making partner, I muttered, recalling the impromptu celebration that had escalated quickly. There was something about the abandoned warehouse at the edge of town that called for a wild party. Timothy Klein, you crazy bastard. I whispered to the reflection in the bathroom mirror, splashing water onto my face. My work as an insurance investigator meant I spent a lot of time alone, analyzing cases and people's lives transformed into dry reports on paper. My job was to detect anything fraudulent so that our company didn't end up paying large sums for fake claims. My childhood was rather ordinary, single mom, older sister who picked on me, and the usual middle-class struggles. As I headed back to the warehouse to retrieve my car, the dark city streets seemed sleepy and indifferent. The real-life location where everything happened is Route 65 on N. Harbor Drive, California. Gray shadows cast by empty buildings stretched across cracked asphalt, the old industrial area hadn't seen much use since companies left town in search of more prosperous zones. Upon arriving at the warehouse, nothing seemed amiss. 
It was abandoned like always, and my car stood parked out front. The faint stench of stale beer reminded me of last night's revelry. As I inspected my car for any damage or signs of theft, I noticed a dark stain on the floor near one of the tires. As I came closer, it turned out to be blood. Not much, but alarming nonetheless. That wasn't there after our party, was it? My investigator instincts kicked in. Checking around cautiously, I found a trail leading toward an unexplored section of the compound. The secluded area seemed much darker than before, probably just clouds passing over the moon, casting eerie shadows off twisted metal debris. My heart thumped loudly as I pushed the door open. The warehouse had definitely seen better days. Inside, the air was thick with something unnameable, an unsettling heaviness that seemed to surround me. Glancing down another corridor, I caught sight of an unusual figure stalking through the shadows. Even from a distance, it appeared otherworldly. Humanoid in shape, but with long limbs covered in what appeared to be scales. Its head bore reptilian markings, and its eyes gleamed unnaturally. I froze, unsure if this was some prank or messed up joke, but unwilling to find out more. Suddenly, my phone rang loudly, jolting me out of my paralyzed state and sending me stumbling backward in fear. Tim, what's going on? You left the party so abruptly, whispered Jasper on the line. I found something, man, I admitted, voice shaking as I tried to gather my thoughts. A trail of blood and some creature hiding in here. Blood? You think one of us got hurt last night? I don't know, I replied, still struggling with disbelief. Whatever this thing is, I'm not sticking around to find out. Moments later, Jasper arrived at the warehouse with our friend Cassandra McRae. We proceeded cautiously back to the area where I had spotted the reptilian creature. No trace remained other than lingering feelings of dread. We need to call for help, insisted Cassandra, her face pale and concerned. You don't know what that thing could have done. But what do we even say? asked Jasper incredulously. Hey there, Officer Smith. We were partying last night and saw a giant lizard man lurking around. They'll throw us in jail for public intoxication. There was no denying that their skepticism mirrored my own doubts about the ordeal. Maybe it was just some weird hallucination triggered by stress or lack of sleep. But something in the back of my mind insisted that this encounter was all too real. We searched the compound, adrenaline pumping loudly in our ears. Just as we were about to call it quits, I caught sight of a small room off to the side, nearly hidden by shadows. Approaching cautiously, I discovered a gruesome scene. The stench hit me first. It was the unmistakable smell of blood, stronger here than outside on the asphalt. Inside the filthy room stood a table covered with broken glass and bits of metal, some bloodied tools lying amidst the chaos. I hesitated, my breath caught in my throat at the sight before me. Cass, Jasper, come look at this, I called out to my friends, trying to keep my voice steady. As they joined me in the small room, their expressions mirrored my own shock. We knew we needed to do something, but what? What could we possibly do against something that seemed straight out of a horror movie? Let's call for help, urged Cassandra once more. We'll call the police and tell them we found a crime scene, agreed Jasper. We don't need to mention the creature, just describe the state of this room. I nodded in agreement. That seemed like a logical plan. Get help without raising suspicion about our potential involvement or sounding crazy. Jasper pulled out his phone and dialed 911. We left the gruesome room while he reported our findings, avoiding further exposure to that sickening sight. While waiting for the police to arrive, I couldn't help but keep an eye out for any movement around us. The hairs on the back of my neck refused to lie flat. I felt as if we were being watched. The reptilian creature was nowhere in sight, but its presence seemed to linger as a hostile reminder of what could be lurking nearby. The police arrived faster than expected, 
their concern driven by our account of the bloody scene. As they investigated the area and spoke with us further, I glanced around nervously. Was it truly gone? Or merely hiding? Just as I turned towards Cassandra and Jasper, intending to discuss our next move, we heard one officer scream in pain and horror. Rushing over, I saw that he was clutching his arm, several long gashes freshly torn into his flesh. What happened? asked another officer as he tried to help his comrade. The injured officer panted heavily as he struggled to find words through his pain. Something just attacked me. Like a big lizard, he gasped. A sudden panic set in within the small group of officers. Guns were drawn, radios crackled with urgent requests for backup, and every moving shadow seemed to be transformed into a potential threat. Cassandra, Jasper, and I huddled together, trying to stay out of their way. Deep down, we knew that it must be the creature. It had come back for us or perhaps felt threatened by the police intrusion. Regardless of its agenda, we couldn't stay here any longer. I grabbed Cassandra's hand while Jasper led the way back towards our car. Every nerve in my body was on edge, my senses heightened by fear mixed with adrenaline. As we reached our vehicle, I swore I could hear the sharp scratching of claws on concrete just behind us. Jasper unlocked the car with shaking fingers, and we piled inside. He gunned the engine and sped away from that wretched warehouse as fast as legally acceptable. I don't know about you guys, I said between ragged breaths, but I'm never going back there. Cassandra and Jasper both nodded, their faces pale with a mixture of relief and lingering terror. In the following days, news reports flocked around the gruesome discovery at the warehouse. There was no mention of a reptilian creature. Only theories focused on gang violence or psychotic perpetrators on the loose. Little did they know about our horrifying encounter with what could only be described as an otherworldly predator. Something most assumed solely existed within the confines of fantastical stories or legends. We never spoke about it again amongst ourselves, a tacit agreement to leave it buried in the past. And although we tried to move forward with our lives, always wondering if someone else would cross paths with that malevolent presence, I knew that hiding deep within my memory was a horror that would stay with me forever. I sighed, dragging my swivel chair across the familiar laminate flooring of my cramped home office. It had been a long day at the insurance agency, and all I wanted was some peace and quiet. My boss, Hilary Tangwall, went on about budget cuts and deadlines again, yet I couldn't shake her irritating tone. The phone rang. It was my cousin, Nasher Myers. He told me he was in town for his new job, and insisted we catch up at a local bar in Galesville. I hesitated, but agreed. We hadn't seen each other since high school, when we played on the rugby team together. Nasher arrived at the bar, slightly out of breath and carrying a bulky backpack. He piled it onto the seat beside us. After laughing for hours about shared memories, our conversation turned serious as he spoke about his new occupation as an animal breeder. Suddenly, he unzipped his backpack to reveal a peculiar contraption made of leather straps and metal buckles. He explained that they were restraints designed for larger animals native to the remote desert in Utah where he worked. Nasher jokingly insisted I accompany him on his upcoming research expedition there. We both knew that my claustrophobic office life wouldn't allow it. His tales of Utah's vast landscape intrigued me. But it wasn't until a few weeks later when curiosity pushed me out of my comfort zone. Work became unbearable with an extensive overtime demand and late-night phone calls from anxious clients. An idea formed. What if I took vacation time to visit Nasher? I called him during my lunch break, telling him I'd be arriving in Utah on Saturday. And after packing hastily that night, I boarded the flight to Salt Lake City. Upon arriving at Nasher's research compound nestled between rocky hills and stretching crimson sands, 
I was amazed by how isolated it was from civilization. In addition to his colleagues' lodgings, the place also housed an array of uncommon animals, some I'd never encountered before. One evening, after a hearty dinner with Nasher and the other researchers, I ventured outside for some fresh air. Enchanted by the mystery of the desert night, I stumbled upon a peculiar cave entrance hidden among the rocky terrain. It hadn't been there during my earlier wanderings in daylight, but now beckoned to me. I heard shuffling footsteps and turned to see Nasher coming over. What's this? I asked, eyeing the entrance he seemed to walk strangely. He stopped a few paces behind me, looking at the cave with fear in his eyes. Nasher gulped and proclaimed that it was best if we stayed away. Rumors circulated around camp that strange things occurred near that cave. He somehow managed to persuade me to go back to our living quarters and forget all about it. That night was when it started. Among murmured conversations about how Utah's mountains inexplicably had changed shape recently, I awoke from a deep sleep to echoing cries in the distance that sounded nothing like animals or humans. The following morning, I found most researchers talking with each other in hushed whispers. They mentioned three people who had gone out exploring were now missing. Nasher didn't leave his room due to agonized groaning inside, which he only managed to explain as being caused by thorns. Nothing seemed normal as we gathered for breakfast. Several doors remained closed throughout the morning as people stayed locked away in their rooms. There was something in the air. Anxiety thrummed through us all like a practiced pianist hitting every discordant note. As if summoned by our fear, an unearthly creature materialized outside one of our windows, casting a long shadow across the room. It stood on two tall legs sporting slanted reptilian skin made of dark green scales with silver speckles. Its head resembled that of an elongated snake. Our screams filled the air as we frantically peered through the dim glass. The next moments seemed to blur into a panicked cacophony. People threw objects around, scurrying for weapons or anything else they could think of to protect themselves against this abomination. When someone tried calling for help, Cell phone service was mysteriously down. I tried to call for help, but my phone had no signal. Everyone else encountered the same issue. Desperate, I appealed to the few researchers left in the room for ideas. We decided that the only solution was to get out of sight and quickly gather anything we could use as weapons. We formed a small group, armed with makeshift weapons such as chair legs and kitchen utensils. In a whisper, we began to communicate our concerns and pass on information about what we had seen. While moving cautiously through the halls of the research facility, we could hear muffled screams occasionally puncture the eerie silence. The creature's presence seemed to sharpen our senses, making us more acutely aware of every creak and groan from within the building. Our breathing grew shallow as we continued exploring the remains of the facility. Doors were left ajar or broken off their hinges. In one room, we found two researchers lying on the floor in pools of their own blood, covered in unbearably grotesque wounds. Their flesh appeared to have been torn apart like paper by some powerful force. I couldn't help but think about Nasher's agonized groans inside his room. Were these the same thorns he mentioned? Or was it something else? We moved further down the hallway when suddenly... A gut-wrenching roar echoed through the facility, its source too close for comfort. Panicked and terror-stricken, we fled into an empty conference room, barricading ourselves with tables and chairs while desperately searching for any hidden exits or escape routes. Guys, I think there might be an emergency exit behind this wall, one researcher whispered as they knocked on different parts of a wall. Feeling a sense of hope rise within us at this revelation, we started working together to knock down the wall that concealed our possible escape route. As we worked tirelessly on breaking through this barrier, we could feel time slipping away. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we broke through the wall and discovered the hidden emergency exit. Knowing that the creature could be lurking around in the building, we decided to wait for nightfall before making our way out of the facility and into the wilderness. 
When darkness fell, we moved cautiously towards the escape route. We finally stepped outside, gasping for air but knowing we couldn't rest just yet. There was no sign of the reptilian creature, but we knew it couldn't be far away. Our instincts told us to make a run for it, so we sped off into the mountains, ignoring our exhaustion and fear. After about a mile of treacherous terrain and constant glances over our shoulders, it seemed as if we were in the clear until a horrifying realization set in. There was no longer any sign of civilization left. The mountains that once looked familiar now loomed over us with an alien menace, as if they were part of some twisted version of reality. We could only assume that this creature's arrival had caused this strange metamorphosis. Our futile attempts to call for help continued as we desperately searched for a return to normalcy. Days became nights as we struggled to survive in this unknown place plagued by perpetual fear. It felt as though our efforts were entirely in vain until one day when our persistence finally paid off. In a last-ditch effort to make contact with civilization as we once knew it, one of us managed to send out a distress signal. Salvation came swiftly as helicopters soon appeared above, lifting us from this nightmarish land terrorized by the reptilian creature. Once transported to safety and debriefed on our experience, an investigation began to uncover details surrounding this monstrous being. Inhospitable mountain ranges were combed by investigators searching for answers, while scientists attempted to explain the bizarre changes in topography which coincided with its arrival. Those who didn't survive the creature's gruesome attacks were mourned and memorialized by the living. The grief still hung heavily in the air as the painful reality sank in that three researchers who had initially gone missing were now confirmed dead, consumed by this creature unconnected to anything we had ever known. I look back and think about the events that unfolded in those horrid days. Every decision, every piece of broken glass and every drop of blood. As I ask myself what could have possibly led to this extraordinary encounter with a reptilian creature from realms unknown, only one thing is certain. Life could never be the same again. I woke up with a pounding headache after a long night at Murphy's Bar celebrating Jerome Winter's birthday after work. My name's Tom Verkley, and I live a pretty simple life working at the local hardware store. Took over my dad's old job when he retired. Married once, no kids, and my buddies were really all I had in this small town of Ashby, Nebraska. After getting dressed and stepping outside of my apartment building, I noticed a crowd gathered just down the street. Conversations filled the air, and police sirens punctuated the unsettling scene. I approached my friend, Pauline Zerbel, who was visibly shaken up. What's going on? I asked. Somebody found Del Stanford's body just behind that building, Pauline whispered to me, pointing at an old bookstore. You mean Del from the post office? That doesn't make any sense, I replied as my heartbeat quickened. Who would do something like this? We don't know yet, Pauline said, her voice cracking. As the week went by, more bodies were discovered in various locations around Ashby. People began locking their doors and staying inside after dark. The town was on edge, gearing up for a wave of terror that we never saw coming or dared to imagine. It was time to take action before our once peaceful town became unrecognizable. A group of us banded together. Jerome Winters... Pauline Zerbel, and another friend named Bryce Elster formed our little investigation squad. We took it upon ourselves to put an end to these gruesome murders when it became clear that the police were getting nowhere. We began searching for any possible links between the victims or anything out of place in town. As we returned from interviewing Dell's relatives one evening, a chilling sight met our eyes when Bryce pointed toward an alley between two buildings an unnerving figure seeming almost inhuman. The creature stood over six feet tall, its scaly and wet-looking greenish-brown skin glinting under the streetlight. Adorned with sharp spikes along its spine and arms, 
The monster resembled something reptilian and otherworldly. It didn't notice us at first. It was busy dragging a lifeless body into the darkness. Without even thinking, I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. But as I pressed the call button, a dead silence filled the air. The creature suddenly turned and stared directly at us with chilling yellow eyes. Run! Jerome shouted past the terror silencing us. We took off in a sprint, headed towards Jerome's truck parked just a few blocks away. As we piled in, I saw that Bryce had been injured during our escape, his pants leg torn open by one of those spiky claws that our monstrous adversary seemed to have in abundance. Gasping for breath as Jerome floored the accelerator, we bolted out of town to get help and recollect ourselves. How could something like this be happening here? Pauline cried out, her voice choked with fear and disbelief. Between his heavy breaths, Jerome offered a shaky response. We need to find a way to let people know what's going on. Larry Eisen will believe us. He's got connections all throughout this town. Larry owned the local newspaper office. If anyone could help spread the word quickly, or point us towards someone who could fight this beast, it would be him. We hurried to Larry Eisen's newspaper office, hoping that he would be able to help us. Upon arriving, we banged on the door, desperate to get his attention. The door opened slowly to reveal a worried-looking Larry. "'What's going on, guys?' Larry asked, assessing our frantic state and Bryce's leg injury. Forcing words through my racing heart, I tried to explain the situation quickly. We saw a creature. It dragged a body away. It attacked Bryce. We need your help. Larry lost no time inviting us in and tending to Bryce's wound. After bandaging it up as best he could, Larry turned his focus back to our harrowing situation. You're not making much sense, Larry said skeptically. What kind of creature are we talking about here? Reptilian. Jerome choked out. It had spikes all over its body and yellow eyes that stared right into you. Larry felt the gravity of our story and nodded solemnly before shifting gears. I'll make some calls to local authorities and my connections around town. In the meantime, why don't you all stay here for now? It's safer. As we waited for Larry's help and resources to arrive, we barricaded ourselves in his office with whatever furniture we could find. We hoped that no one else would have the misfortune of encountering this creature. A couple of hours later, a team from a nearby city arrived with unexpectedly professional-looking gear after hearing our pleas for assistance. They turned out to be specialists in dealing with unknown dangerous creatures. We can't thank you enough for coming, I said as I shook the hand of their team leader who introduced himself as Agent Martin. Just doing our job, Martin replied with an air of confidence that seemed contagious as his team got straight to strategizing on how best to deal with this fearsome reptilian monster. Within no time, they had formed a plan and began setting up traps around town, hoping to catch the creature before it could hurt more people. Armed with tracking devices and night vision goggles, they coordinated their efforts with Larry, who used his local expertise to identify possible hideouts. Throughout the night, their efforts yielded little success. However, during the early hours of the morning, one of their tracking devices triggered, indicating that the creature was making its way towards an isolated warehouse on the outskirts of town. Immediately, Agent Martin and his team headed to the location, cornering the reptilian creature as it feasted upon another lifeless body. The team engaged in a tense standoff with the beast, neither side willing to be the first to take action. Martin muttered a command into his radio, initiating their plan in full force. Flashbangs exploded around the creature in a deafening cacophony as team members surrounded it with precision. Caught off guard by the sudden onslaught of light and noise, the creature thrashed wildly as tranquilizer darts were expertly fired into its tough exterior. With more than ten tranquilizer darts embedded in its greenish-brown skin, the reptilian monster finally fell unconscious. The team slowly approached it, 
cautiously ensuring that it was truly incapacitated. As they shackled and secured it onto a transport vehicle hidden a safe distance away from prying eyes, we couldn't help but feel a mixture of relief and trepidation at what we had just witnessed. The truth about this monstrous being was still so far from our understanding. Agent Martin shook our hands once again, assuring us that they would closely study our uninvited visitor. You're brave for contacting us, he commended. We won't let this happen again. In the weeks that followed, life gradually returned to normal, though nothing could erase what we'd seen or replace those who were lost. Larry made sure the newspaper documented our ordeal and kept its readers informed as the investigation unfolded. It became clear that the creature was something far beyond our comprehension, an extraterrestrial being stranded and hungry. For us, life would never be the same. As we mourned the lost lives at a vigil organized by Larry, we could only hope that this terrifying chapter of our lives had come to a true end. I never expected to find myself in the small town of Elmdale, nestled in the remote hills of West Virginia. People here seemed to stick to their own, and for a reason. Disappearances. Not just any disappearances, though. These were more than random crimes. Elmdale had become known for a pattern of missing persons cases spanning generations. One evening, I found myself in a local bar a dingy establishment that felt out of place in an otherwise quaint village. I struck up a conversation with a few patrons, hoping to learn something about the recent disappearances. One man, Dalton Purcell, reluctantly shared that he had lost his brother years prior in a similar occurrence. We sat down and Dalton told me his story. His brother, Ellis Purcell, had ventured into the woods bordering the town, but never returned. There was no trace left behind, despite extensive searches by local authorities and volunteers, just like many other cases over the years. Dalton's tale struck me as interesting in that despite no apparent connection to the victims, he suspected one possible cause, an elusive reptilian creature that had been sighted around Elmdale throughout history. The next day, I ventured into the woods where Ellis had vanished, along with countless others before him. As I hiked deeper into the trees, I stumbled upon several fresh scrapes on tree trunks and what looked like claw marks on rocks and mossy banks. While investigating these peculiar marks, I encountered another local man named Walter Kinsley, who claimed he knew more about these mysterious markings. Walter confided that he believed them to be the work of the same unexplained creature which had taken his granddaughter three years prior. Together we pushed further into the woods. By now it was dusk, and as shadows grew long, an eerie silence settled around us. That's when we found it. A seemingly bottomless pit ringed with those unsettling scratch marks on the surrounding rocks. It radiated malevolence that seemed to taint the air. A plan formed rapidly in our minds. We would descend into this pit tomorrow hoping to find answers to the decades of disappearances and perhaps confront the thing responsible. As I returned to my temporary lodging, I couldn't shake the feeling of being observed as if a sinister presence had latched onto me. On the fateful day, we plunged into the abyss, harnesses and flashlights secured. As we descended, our beams catching glimpses of torn clothing, abandoned equipment, even old bones... We knew we were closing in on something ancient and monstrous. Suddenly, around a bend in the pit's shaft, we caught sight of something beyond imagination. A massive reptilian creature with long black claws and rows upon rows of serrated teeth. Its bulging green eyes darted around maliciously as it hissed and spat, lurking inside a cavern wall crevice near unseen human remains. My mind raced. Here was tangible proof of this nightmare's existence, something no one could deny any longer. But what to do now? One wrong move would cost both our lives. There was no signal below ground to call for help. A pull of a trigger 
or an attempt to flee would be disastrous. I exchanged a fearful look with Walter, a look that implied both terror and determination. But before we could act on our mutually understood plan, the forest above began emitting alarmed cries and gunshots echoed from Wheeling's search team above. Others had followed us here. They'd realized what Walter and I found. Their loved one's abductor was finally within reach. Knowing we couldn't call for help underground, Walter and I silently agreed to make a stand against this creature. If only we had a bit more time, we could have prepared better. But the sounds above were getting closer, signaling that the search party had discovered our location. The reptilian creature slithered out of its crevice, revealing its full, terrifying form. It was enormous, its scaly body stretched out at least twenty feet, ending in a powerful tail that constantly twitched with anticipation. Its muscular legs showed it could move quickly if provoked. We had to be careful. Walter motioned to me, pointing at the creature's eyes. We knew that blinding it would be our best chance. As it approached us, Walter grabbed a flare from his bag. He ignited it with a striking sound that echoed through the cavern. The creature hissed violently and lunged toward us. Walter threw the flare at its face, aiming for those bulging green eyes, but missed by inches. I quickly grabbed my flashlight and shone it directly into its eyes as it came closer. The creature recoiled in pain, allowing us precious seconds to scramble up the pit wall to safety before our assailant recovered. We could hear the search party approaching. They definitely heard our commotion, but were unaware of the danger they were walking into. Folks! I shouted hoarsely, trying to warn them without alerting the creature any further. Stay clear! Creature in pit! My voice echoed off the walls of the cave. A confused murmur rippled through the group above as they pieced together what was happening below them. Moments later, two members of our team appeared at the edge of the pit, staring down in horror at what they saw. Noticing their stunned faces, Walter didn't waste any time. Toss down your ropes, now! Walter barked at them. Two ropes dropped down to us as the rest of the team slowly backed away from the pit. Hastily attaching ourselves, we began our ascent. The creature launched itself at us, but its massive form couldn't move with precision in these tight spaces. Dangling in midair, we frantically scaled up the ropes as quick as our worn-out bodies would allow. As we rose, Walter shouted instructions to the search party to gather more ropes so they could contain the creature when it eventually tried to escape. By sheer luck and determination, we made it back to the surface. The once frantic search party now worked in measured synchronization, tying ropes across the pit's entrance. The reptilian beast roared and thrashed below, enraged by both losing its prey and being blinded in one eye by my flashlight. Walter surveyed our makeshift operation with grim satisfaction, knowing we'd halted this monster for now, but for how long? As adrenaline wore off and injuries became apparent, the team tended to one another. Some had twisted ankles or bruised ribs from their hasty descent into the pit, following our distressed cries. It was with overwhelming relief that it seemed no lives had been lost. Eventually the authorities arrived and took over the containment efforts. As they cuffed us for safety and led us away from the scene, I glanced back at that cursed pit, a gaping maw leading straight to hell. In those moments before our discovery, it had briefly just been Walter and me against the creature. Now it was out there for all to witness. Questions would follow. What was this thing? Where was it from? Is it alone? Speculation could wait. Exhaustion took hold as I allowed myself to be led away. The team returned home to nurse their physical and mental scars together. Walter and I each kept an aching dread deep inside, that someday this creature or something worse will return. However long that fleeting period of peace might last, we made a silent pact. We'll be there to face the nightmare again, side by side.
I woke up to the sound of footsteps down the hallway of my small apartment in Glendale, Arizona. My name is Walter Evanston, a middle-aged bachelor working as an accountant. Scratching my five o'clock shadow, I glanced at the time and frowned. It was way too early for any visitors. Slowly, I made my way toward the entrance and peeked through the keyhole. A woman wearing a stained white dress was shuffling past my door. Her movements seemed almost inhuman, disjointed and slow. Suddenly she stopped in front of Frank's apartment next door. Frank was your typical old grump, lived by himself and we barely spoke. The figure started pounding on his door despite frail arms that looked like they could snap any moment. With every knock, something seemed off about her skin texture, like scales glittered subtly under the dim hallway light. There were only two apartments on this floor, and after it became evident that Frank wasn't answering his door, I began to wonder if it was wise to call for help. I retreated to my bedroom, trying not to make noise as I grabbed the landline phone from my nightstand. Searching for any logical explanation, I dialed 911 discreetly so that she wouldn't hear me. When the operator responded, their voice was drowned out by a loud crash outside in the hallway. With sweat beating on my forehead, I hung up the phone and carefully walked back toward the entrance area to see what had happened. I gasped as I saw Frank's door smashed into pieces, along with blood smeared across my apartment wall. Before I could process what had just happened, an ear-splitting scream echoed from Frank's apartment. The mixture of terror and pain made me shudder involuntarily. Slowly moving back into my apartment, I heard footsteps coming down the hall again. It was a police officer sent to check on us after my call. The man introduced himself as Officer Jeremiah Collins, and I began recounting all the strange events to him. Odd behavior, you say? A woman with scaled skin? He asked, raising an eyebrow and scribbling down notes. I nodded nervously, feeling foolish for not dialing 911 immediately. We decided to enter Frank's apartment carefully. The dark apartment was in disarray, furniture overturned and signs of a struggle everywhere. Searching cautiously, we found Frank's lifeless body lying on his bedroom floor by a smashed window. Horrified by the scene of gore and destruction, my legs nearly failed me. Officer Collins did his best to ease my fear with a joke. At least this isn't happening on a Monday, he quipped. Suddenly, loud footsteps sounded from the fire escape outside the window. Peeking through the partially shattered glass, we caught glimpses of that scale-covered figure retreating quickly into the darkness below. Realizing quickly that something unnatural was at play here, Officer Collins withdrew his gun as we made our way through the apartment to access the fire escape from another adjoining room. Stay close, he advised, as we lowered ourselves onto the fire escape and began descending cautiously toward the ground level. If we can corner her without letting her know we're right behind her. We continued our pursuit, navigating around the apartment complex in search of the creature. The psychological toll of the gruesome events had kept me from calling anyone else for help. Not knowing what this being was, or if it was some sort of prank, I feared public ridicule if I implicated myself in any way, not to mention how further involvement could put others at risk. As we reached the ground level, we carefully surveyed our surroundings. The dimly lit alleyway provided little cover, and every sound seemed to echo ominously around us. Officer Collins motioned for us to split up and investigate two small adjacent alleys. With gun raised, I hesitantly took one route, while Officer Collins approached the other. I crept along cautiously, hands trembling in fear and anticipation. That's when I noticed a trail of fresh blood on the ground. It resembled what I saw earlier near Frank's lifeless body. Suddenly, Officer Collins's muffled screams pierced through the silence. They were abruptly cut short. My blood ran cold as I realized he was in grave danger or already dead. Panic-stricken but driven by a sense of obligation, I sprinted towards the sound of his struggle, only to find what was left of Officer Collins his mauled and dismembered body sprawled across the pavement. 
The shock sent me sprawling back against a wall. My breath caught in my chest, and tears threatened to fall when I noticed the creature approaching me. The same reptilian figure with scale-covered skin, glistening under the faint streetlights. This horrible monster now stood before me, its elongated limbs ending in razor-sharp claws that dripped crimson onto the pavement below. Its eyes bore into mine with cold malevolence as it bared its grotesque teeth. Somehow mustering courage despite my terror, I shakily raised my gun at it to defend myself, knowing full well how futile an effort it might be. Suddenly it lunged at me. Instinctively, I dove out of the way and fired a shot, grazing the creature's shoulder. The creature emitted a blood-curdling screech of pain and fury as it quickly turned back to me, now setting its sights on me with apparent determination to tear me limb from limb like Officer Collins. Surprisingly, the gunshot attracted the attention of several nearby residents who began to peer out windows or gather in doorways to see what was happening. The reptilian horror seemed aware of the growing crowd and hesitated in its pursuit of me. Perhaps it was uncertain whether to deal with this newfound obstacle or continue targeting me. The commotion also allowed me enough time to rapidly back away while keeping my gun aimed between the creature's eyes. In that moment, sirens started blaring in the distance. Backup was on its way, likely responding to the gunshots in the area. The creature appeared uneasy, as if sensing that humans could pose a challenge en masse. With an unnerving snarl, it fled into a nearby sewer opening, disappearing from sight just as several police cars raced into the area. The following days became a flurry of media coverage and investigations. Local authorities and federal agents scrutinized every detail. However, they found no conclusive proof of what had happened beyond victims' testimonies and scant evidence. Many speculated about some secretive government experiment gone wrong, while others whispered about supernatural occurrences. Remembering that night still haunts my dreams, replaying visions of Frank's death and Officer Collins' gruesome end. They were good people who only tried to help during those horrifying moments, but instead paid for it with their lives. I am left only with speculation about what that cruel creature was, an alien species hiding among us or some twisted experiment by our own government. What I do know is that this reptilian monster was anything but human. I still jump at the sound of strange noises in the night and the urban legends that circulate through the city unnervingly bring back memories of that terrifying encounter. I was sitting on the cramped couch, sharing a single-room apartment with my friend Bruce Waldstein in Hoboken, New Jersey. We were watching a game, taking in the view from our small window that offered glimpses of the Hudson River. Sharing a chuckle every now and then, life seemed to be inching toward normalcy. Little did I know that everything was about to change. Working as a plumber didn't afford this lifestyle I once enjoyed as an attorney. However, since the passing of my wife two years ago, taking up this trade helped me avoid causing more pain with each guilty verdict I achieved. As Bruce left the room to grab some food, a knock on our door interrupted my thoughts. Bruce Waldstein? A voice boomed from behind the door. I opened it to find two police officers who wanted to speak with Bruce. Apparently there were two murders nearby, and he was their last customer. Bruce returned and handled the situation professionally. They left satisfied with his answers, but something poisoned my mind about those recent events. Days went by, and murders continued across town in an uncanny pattern wherever we carried out plumbing jobs or delivered parts. It became harder to ignore the peculiar connection. The neighborhood became filled with whispers of bizarre occurrences at each crime scene, tales of victims with strange markings and broken bones giving birth to gruesome scenes. For me, there was no avoiding the question any longer. Why only occurring where we went? However, this had to be a mere coincidence. Terrible things happen everywhere. 
it's just an ugly fact of life. After another long day, Bruce and I got a call for a late-night plumbing emergency at Jerry's Bar across town. Hurrying over, we commenced repairs in the dark bar due to a temporary power outage. While working in near darkness, an ear-piercing screech echoed through the bar, followed by thuds from the front entrance. I instinctively grabbed the flashlight and cautiously approached. Shockingly, Jerry lay contorted on the ground, blood pooling around him. As I tried to process what had just happened, something snatched me up in a tight grip. Struggling against the overwhelming force holding me, I managed to escape its grasp for a brief moment. A blinding light from a flashlight highlighted the monstrous creature, a mix of reptilian and humanoid-like features. Its eyes burned into my soul while blood dripped from its razor-sharp claws. This was what I feared from the gruesome tales, but never did I imagine it to be true. Scrambling through the darkness, Bruce's yelling suddenly ceased. The creature must have found him. Yet there was no time to call for help amidst this surreal terror. Our lives hung in the balance. I found Bruce in excruciating pain as blood flowed from his arm. Realizing our best chance was reaching the alleyway's dead end with only one entrance, we hobbled together down that dim passage of hope. My head raced with possibilities of why this creature seemed bent on our destruction. Our connection to those murders now undeniably intertwined with this nightmare before us. I tried to comprehend how our paths led to this monstrous being, like pieces of an elaborate puzzle falling into place. Backed into a corner of that cold alleyway, sweat and fear intermingled, weapons in hand. An iron rod and a plumber's wrench, our unlikely arsenal against an unknown enemy. It felt as if everything had led us here to face this abominable reality, lurking in dark corners beneath a veil of secrecy that held deadly consequences. Feeling the creature's presence drawing closer, I knew our time was running out. Bruce's strength was waning, and with every step, his grip on me tightened. The alleyway kept getting darker and narrower as we stumbled forward. Help! I yelled, hoping someone would hear our desperate plea. The creature continued its pursuit and let out a guttural growl that echoed through the walls of the alley. Why aren't you calling the police? Bruce asked, breathing heavily. I can't, I replied, clutching my phone in my hand. There's no signal down here. I could hear the panic rising in his voice as he said, We have to find a way out of here. This thing is going to kill us. As the creature lunged towards us, we turned a corner just in time and found ourselves facing a dead end. There were no other routes to take. We were cornered like rats and completely vulnerable. Stay behind me, I told Bruce, readying my iron rod while he gripped his wrench tighter. We knew that this might be our final stand, but we had no other choice. It was either fight or die. The reptilian beast approached us slowly its eyes glowing as if they were filled with the fires of malice itself. The creature's scales glistened under the moonlight as it opened its grotesque maw to reveal rows of dagger-like teeth. Each step it took produced an indescribable sound that made my skin crawl. Suddenly, just as it reached striking distance, a sharp explosion echoed through the alleyway. A gunshot. The deafening noise pierced my ears and disoriented both us and the creature for a moment. Blood oozed from its shoulder where it had been hit by a bullet. Unexpectedly, another individual appeared from behind us. An off-duty police officer who happened to be walking by the alley when he heard our cries for help. He aimed his gun at the beast and fired a second shot. The creature staggered back, hissing in pain, before retreating into the shadows. Are you folks all right? Asked the officer, his gun still drawn and his voice steady. Thank you, I said with a weak sigh of relief. Bruce nodded in agreement. What in God's name was that thing? Questioned the officer, bewildered. I shook my head, unable to find the right words to describe such an abomination. 
but something inside me now demanded an understanding of what we had just survived. For once in my life, I felt bound to uncover the horrifying mystery behind this monstrous creature that had hunted us so mercilessly. Days later, bruised and battered from our encounter, Bruce and I found ourselves delving deep into the realm of conspiracy theories and cryptozoological creatures. We couldn't let go of the horrific memory etched into our minds. Eventually, we came across accounts of reptilian beings, an ancient species rumored to be not quite of this world, known for their violent tendencies and malevolent intentions toward humanity. Although I could never prove with absolute certainty that those tales were connected to the beast we encountered in that dark alleyway, our lives had undeniably changed forever. We had stared death in the face, fought a battle against a twisted nightmare, and somehow survived by mere chance. While no one would ever truly comprehend what Bruce and I went through that night, all I could do was hope that no other person would have to face such terror again. Our gruesome ordeal silently haunted us, a chilling reminder of how fragile life can be when confronted by unimaginable horrors lurking within shadows where we least expect them. I'm James Merrick, a regular guy with a passion for mountain biking. I recently moved from my job as an accountant to start a new life in Placerville, California. The main attraction was access to the scenic rural trails famous among cyclists like me. One Sunday morning, I remember that day clearly, I met up with Elwyn Bowden and Simeon Machado, two buddies who shared my love for the trails. We began our ride early, enjoying the crisp air and the natural beauty surrounding us. As we biked deeper into the forest, Simeon related tales of how his father almost lost his leg in a car accident. Elwyn recounted the hilarious story when he mistakenly attended the wrong funeral, only to make a speech to strangers. Our laughter echoed in the trees. Alongside a nearby river, we decided to take a break and admire the clear water. As we caught our breaths, Simeon noticed something by the riverbank that seemed out of place. A bicycle tangled in some bushes caught our attention. Its wheels faced skyward and rusted spokes tangled together. We approached it cautiously and noticed streaks of blood on the ground. It was clear someone had been injured there recently. No one appeared to be around, so we chose to call local law enforcement using Elwyn's satellite phone. After reporting what we discovered, we ventured onto higher ground on foot to wait for their arrival. As minutes turned into hours, unease stirred within us. We shared stories to pass time, but couldn't shake off this oppressive air hovering around us. Just when darkness began to fall, we spotted movement near our bikes, an unidentifiable creature emerging from the shadows. It had scales covering its body and slitted yellow eyes that grew more menacing as it crept cautiously toward our belongings. Although a strange fear crept down my spine as it approached closer, I couldn't help but to examine its form. Four fingers and a thumb on both hands were clenched in an unsettling manner, displaying lengthy claws that could easily rip through flesh. Its legs resembled those of a reptile, and long, leathery tail dragging behind it. We stared at each other momentarily, unsure of how to react. It seemed to be assessing us, just as much as we were assessing it. Simultaneously, I found humor in the situation saying to my buddies, You know, guys, I think we bit off more than we can chew with this adventure. Simeon murmured his agreement, but couldn't seem to get past his shock and fear, while Elwyn tried to remain calm by cracking another joke. Well, if we knew this would happen today, we probably would have stayed home. As our group faced the creature, its attention remained drawn to something in the shadows, just out of view from our position. A barely audible noise interrupted the silence and caught everyone's attention, including the creatures. My blood turned cold as a creeping terror seized my heart. Electing not to wait around any longer for the police to show up or figure out what's going on with this alienish monstrosity, 
Elwyn announced that we should head back into town immediately. You're right, I agreed, my voice barely steady as the strange beast seemed to focus on some growing commotion from within the woods. Simeon readily concurred with a hasty nod. Just as we decided to rush down the path back into town while leaving our bikes behind, shots rang out echoing into the night air. Dread increasingly washing over me like icy water, I saw human silhouettes entering the clearing where horrible stuff was going down. Ignoring their protests and demands for us to stop, or they would shoot us down too, I forced my legs onward simultaneously, pushing away thoughts of what had just happened. Fear propelled me forward, my friends following as the creatures closing in from behind. We sprinted back toward town, our breaths coming out in short, heavy gasps. The silhouettes behind us transformed into uniformed officers, desperately trying to gain control over the reptilian creature that had now revealed itself from the shadows. We could hear their shouts and panicked orders as bullets rained onto the beast. We kept on running, not wanting to look back or think about what was happening. All we knew was we needed to get away. As we entered the town's perimeter, a sense of safety helped me catch my breath. What do you think that thing was? Simeon asked, his voice shaken. Do you think it's some sort of experiment? Elwyn speculated, breathing heavily. I shook my head. I don't know, but we need help. We should find someone who can handle this. Maybe the military or some government agency. We cautiously made our way toward the police station while keeping an eye out for any signs of danger or disorder in the town. When we reached the station, I nervously stepped inside and approached the officer at the front desk, relaying our encounter as best as I could without succumbing to fear. His eyes widened as he took in our disheveled appearances and serious expressions. He quickly made a phone call, updating his superiors about the situation and requesting immediate aid. As we waited for backup to arrive, people within the station whispered among themselves about the creature and theorized its origin though no conclusion could be reached. Not long after, a tactical team arrived. Armed soldiers streamed into town as they secured areas surrounding where we had first encountered the reptilian monstrosity. The officers escorted us to a temporary command center set up near the scene where experts questioned us in great detail about our experience. After answering numerous questions that delved into every aspect imaginable related to our encounter with the creature, we were finally allowed to leave. As we walked home, feeling exhausted and numb, I couldn't help but glance at the dark woods where everything had started. I knew that, given how little we knew about the creature's existence and motives, this night would undoubtedly haunt us for a long time to come. A few days later, we were informed that the reptilian beast had been subdued and captured. It was transported to an undisclosed location for further study. The officers refused to divulge any more information, leaving us once again feeling uncertain and unsettled. Rumors around town began to circulate with wild speculation about the creature's origins. Was it the result of a military experiment gone wrong or something much more otherworldly? Simeon... Elwyn and I found ourselves wanting answers but knowing that we would receive none. I thought about those who lost their lives that night in the woods, the officers who had tried to control the violent creature as it terrorized our sleepy town. They had faced unimaginable dangers out of a sense of duty, and their heroics would not be forgotten by me or my friends, as weeks slowly turned into months, which turned into years. Finally, our once close-knit group began growing distant as each of us tried to move on with our lives and forget the terrifying memories of that night. But every so often, in a quiet moment when my thoughts would drift back to that horrifying encounter with the reptilian creature from the shadows, I couldn't help but wonder what else lay hidden out there in the dark woods beyond our small town, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to cross its path. It all began when I, Thomas Abernathy, moved to a small town in Oregon named Briarwood. I needed a fresh start after a messy divorce 
and decided to open my shop fixing vintage electronics. Everyone in town was friendly and welcoming, but there was something off about the picturesque mountain community. One day, Abraham Pennington visited my shop. He asked if I could repair an antique radio he found in his grandmother's attic. This would usually be a routine task for me, but when I looked at the device, a sense of dread came over me. Over the next few days, strange things started happening. My tools would go missing or end up in bizarre places. Whispers were heard outside my window, and the mysterious markings on the radio seemed to grow clearer and more ominous each time I looked at them. Feeling uneasy, I went to see Abigail O'Donnell, a local historian with more knowledge about Briarwood than anyone else could remember. She invited me into her cramped study layered with historical artifacts from the town over generations. When I showed her the radio, Abigail turned pale and told me the dark history of Briarwood, how several hundred years ago, settlers reported terrifying animal attacks with no clear origin. Many members of their tight-knit community disappeared without a trace, only to be found dead later with inexplicable injuries. As we sat in her study discussing these ancient legends and unsolved mysteries, Abigail confessed that she believed these horrifying episodes stemmed from an unknown creature residing deep within the surrounding forests, something otherworldly yet undeniably intelligent. Together we delved into research about potential explanations for these disturbing occurrences while strange events continued to unfold around us. A week later, our suspicions were seemingly confirmed when Samuel Higgins stumbled into town covered in bizarre scratches that didn't match any known creature in the region. Amid fearful whispered speculation and growing panic among townspeople, I organized a search party with fellow residents Henry Rutherford and Simon Wellington to venture into the forest and find answers. As we trekked deeper, the environment seemed to distort with every step. Trees twisted unnaturally, branches appeared torn off as if by powerful claws, and indescribable tracks marked the muddy ground beneath our feet. All of us felt uneasy, but our determination to restore safety to Briarwood overpowered any doubts. That was until an ungodly screech echoed through the forest sending chills down our spines. Simon insisted he saw something slither unnaturally around us and rushed off track with a knife in hand. Henry hesitated for a moment before sprinting after him, leaving me alone between the twisted trunks. Terrifying thoughts raced through my mind as I grappled with my fear and the growing realization of what we were facing. What is this horrendous creature haunting Briarwood? How can we hope to stop it without knowing its weaknesses? The sun dipped behind dark clouds as night drew closer, turning the oppressive atmosphere even more treacherous. Suddenly in the distance, I saw movement, a grotesque figure unlike anything on earth with sinister reptilian features crawling through the foliage. I called out desperately for Simon and Henry, my voice barely rising above the cacophony of the forest. They didn't respond. Terrified, I decided to make my way back towards the town, hoping to find them on the journey home. As I hurried through the increasingly mutilated environment, the creature followed closely behind. Though I couldn't see it clearly, I could feel its presence, sense its size and weight as it crushed branches under its massive form. Every time I turned around, hoping to catch a glimpse of it, all that remained were the broken remnants of nearby foliage smashed apart by the brutal impact of its movements. I continued my frantic escape from this nightmarish creature. It was clear fighting was not an option, not against this enormous beast, and looking for answers would only lead to a gruesome end. My only hope was to survive and warn others in Briarwood. A sudden rustling caught my attention. I held my breath and braced myself for what might emerge from the twisted underbrush. To my relief, Henry burst onto the path. He glanced around wildly, his face streaked with sweat and fear. Where's Simon? He gasped when he saw me standing there. Fear gripped me as I realized that the silence that engulfed Simon earlier signified a fatal outcome. Before I had a chance to reply or muster any sympathy for our lost friend, however, 
we heard a guttural growl erupting through the shadows behind us. It sounded far too close for comfort. We have to go, I urged Henry as we broke into a mad sprint, both of us unwilling to look back in case we became paralyzed with terror. What little light remained cast menacing shadows across our surroundings, making every leaf and gnarled root seem sinister. Beneath our feet, we could feel the earth shuddering with each monstrous step this creature took in pursuit. With every breathless stride, we kept our focus on the forest's edge. We just needed to reach the town and its people to have any chance of surviving. As we neared Briarwood, the creature's guttural growls grew louder and more vicious, like metal scraping against rock. It was unbearably gruesome, echoing through my core and setting my heart racing. Suddenly, there was a commotion in the distance, dogs barking frantically accompanied by shouts of alarm. We called for help with renewed hope, finally reaching the edge of Briarwood, where our pleas were met with wide-eyed stares from bewildered townspeople. Seeing our desperate expressions and hearing our account of this reptilian beast stalking us through the woods confirmed their worst fears. Samuel Higgins's incident was only the beginning. As the events unfolded in Briarwood, it became a struggle for survival for all those who lived there. The villagers banded together to protect one another from this horrific creature that had emerged from deep within the forest. No one knew anything about this monstrous creature. Information on reptilian beings was scarce in our little town, let alone about something resembling an alien species. We didn't bother with folklore. No such answers could be found in ancient myth and legend for a creature so alien and terrifying. This enemy was altogether different. Though I bore witness to the beast's violent onslaught from a safe distance, and while I mourned Simon and others like him, whose lives were cut short, I vowed never to forget their memory. Drawing on this visceral experience and terrorized like never before, I dedicated myself to protecting others from suffering the same fate. Together with Henry and remaining townspeople who had survived these disastrous events, we transformed Briarwood into a fortified refuge where no monstrous entity would ever threaten us again. We fortified walls and established watch teams day and night to keep everyone safe. We were survivors determined not to forget those we had lost to this nightmarish creature that had inexplicably invaded our town. As time went on, we learned to live with the shadow this tragedy cast over us. Briarwood was forever changed. We held on to one simple truth. Survival was a hard-fought victory against an enemy that defied all logic and understanding.